Hello, this is a presentation titled Understanding Abdominal Wall Anatomy as it relates to abdominal wall reconstruction. Here are my disclosures. So I decided to make this presentation uh, uh, because I think uh, as you know, I interact uh, more with surgeons and uh, there's a significantly more interest in uh, retromuscular dissection, which includes the reef stopper repairs as well as transverse abdominis release. And uh, things uh, uh, in the retromuscular anatomy, those that do this procedure can get quite confusing. And uh, perhaps the most important thing, in my opinion, uh, between success and failure uh, of those repairs is really truly understanding the anatomy, the foundation, and, and understanding the relationship of the structures in the space um, in order not to um, uh, cause any inadvertent injury. So we're looking at down wall, the uh, overview, I think most people are familiar with the muscle groups that make up the interior down wall include uh, laterally, the external oblique muscle, followed by the internal oblique muscle, followed by the uh, transversus abdominis muscle, uh, which is uh, referred to actually as a corset of abdominal wall. Uh, in the middle, we have the rectus abdominis muscles here, which are connected by uh, the linea alba. The linea alba is composed of the uh, fibrinous structure of collagen and elastin. The normal width of the linear alba is about 1.5 to 2.2 centimeters. Anything wider than uh, that is considered to be a diastatic linear alba. Now, um, when we look at the cross section of abdominal wall, if we take a cross section above the arcuate line, what we're going to see is uh, the oval uh, cross section of the rectus abdominis muscle, and then you're going to see uh, the lateral compartment muscles contributing to the sheath. Uh, of the anterior rectus sheath as well as the posterior rectus sheath. So you have the external oblique muscle which contributes the external oblique aponeurosis to anterior rectus sheath. Then you have the internal oblique muscle. And the internal oblique muscle is an interesting muscle. It splits into two lamella, the anterior lamella of internal oblique and the posterior lamella of internal oblique. So the anterior lamella of internal oblique also contributes uh, to the anterior rectus sheath where the posterior contributes to the posterior rectus sheath. So the internal oblique muscle really truly is the only muscle which completely envelopes uh, the rectus abdominis muscle at this level. It's kind of like a pillowcase around the rectus abdominis muscle. Then deeper and uh, deeper uh, after the internal oblique, you're going to have the transverse abdominis muscle. And transverse abdominis muscle is an interesting muscle as well as it contributes a muscular fibrous portions to the posterior rectus sheath in the upper third of the abdomen. As you go down, uh, progress down uh, towards the pubis and continue taking the cross sections, you'll see that the actual muscular portions migrate laterally and the only thing that uh, structure that the transversus abdominis muscle contributes to the posterior to sheath is the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. Uh, I'll come back to that point. Below the arcuate line, you have no posterior to sheath. So, You'll have rectus abdominis muscle, then you'll have the transversalis fascia followed by the peritoneum. And the suprapubic region, essentially, you'll have this uh, peritoneal umbilical ligament flap as well as uh, associated with the bladder. So, when talking about linea semilinaris, linea semilinaris is actually a lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle. And that uh, location of linea semilinaris relation to the midline can vary. It really depends on the width of rectus abdominis muscle. The average width of rectus abdominis muscle is 7.5 centimeters. It can be wider. I've seen personally in clinical practice of about 14, 15 centimeters uh, uh, width of rectus abdominis muscle that can happen. I also see it as uh, narrow as 4 centimeters. And this also can come back uh, to uh, uh, have some clinical implications as we talk about the uh, retro rectus repair and placement of mesh behind the rectus abdominis muscle and uh, when we th uh, think about hernia repair we also think about the width of the mesh that we're placing and so sometimes the retro rectus space can limit the uh, size of the mesh you place. That's something you need to keep in mind that's why it's important also to know the average uh, width of rectus abdominis muscle. Also, uh, you know, I'm gonna, this is the only uh, movie here that where I'm going to show external oblique release, but when you do external oblique release, if you still do them, what we look for after raising the flaps is 
with feel for linear semilinearis. So you see the surgeon here feeling for linear semilinearis. The, uh, he has a the rectus abdominis muscle in his left hand and feeling the lateral border and we step away about two to two and a half centimeters away from linear semilinaris and they make the vision in external oblique aponeurosis or actually dividing the external oblique muscle to create uh, the anterior component separation so when you make this division uh, then uh, deeper inside you're going to see the internal oblique muscle so this is uh, here a video demonstrating external oblique release um, the uh, legs are to the right of the screen, the head is to the left of the screen. We are doing external oblique release on the patient's right side. Again, release about two to two and a half centimeters away from linear semilinaris laterally, completely dividing the muscle, as well as uh, to get a full release of external oblique, which you need to do then afterwards, separate the um, external oblique uh, muscle away from its avascular attachments to the deeper internal oblique muscle. And that's what we're doing right now, breaking down those avascular attachments to give a view a full component release of the abdominal wall here. But uh, to go back to the uh, transversus abdominis muscle, and as I was talking about its muscular contributions to posterior rectus sheath, all you have to do uh, to see this relationship is pull up CT scan on any patient that you have and look at the axial views of, of upper third of abdominal wall on any of your patients. What you'll see is you'll see the lateral border here represented by linear semilinaris, and you'll see the muscle fibers here circled in the red actually con uh, contributing to the posterior rectus sheath. So transversus abdominis muscle contributes to posterior rectus sheath in the upper third of the abdomen. So I'm going to show this relationship here. Uh, we're looking at the right side here. Uh, the outlined structure here is the linear semilinaris, again, lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle. You can see the arcuate line here. Above the arcuate line, you have actual posterior rectus sheath. Below the arcuate line, there's no posterior rectus sheath. And then this is the relationship of transverse abdominis muscle to the posterior rectus sheath. Again, in the upper third of the abdomen, the transversus abdominis muscle contributes muscular fibers. In the lower portion of the abdomen, it has no muscular contributions to the posterior rectus sheath, only aponeurotic contributions. So when you do your transversus abdominis release, this in blue here represents the line of the division in transversus abdominis. What we do is we stay medial to linear semilinaris. Uh, we only divide the muscle in the upper third of the abdominal wall, but as we go down and travel, continue travel just medial to linear semilinaris towards the arcuate line, we divide the posterior lamella of internal oblique, which contributes to posterior rectus sheath, and the second layer down below is the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. I'll come back to that as well. And please also note that in the upper third, uh, the, the, uh, the actual release is curved into the subxiphoid fat pad or preperitoneal space in the middle. I'll come back to spaces and how it relates to transverse abdominis release a little bit later, a few slides. So, so next, I'd like to talk about abdominal wall nerves. So specifically when uh, talking about the interior abdominal wall, uh, we I have to think about the nerves that travel between the transversus abdominis muscle and internal oblique muscle. They include the T7 to T11 uh, nerve fibers uh, that penetrate the rectus abdominis muscle. Uh, again, they'll penetrate the linear semilinaris uh, and uh, uh, will uh, travel up with the underside of the rectus abdominis muscle. Those nerve fibers will become important as we talk about doing the transverse abdominis release and also realizing where linear semilinaris is. The division of uh, when performing the transverse abdominis release, you have to stay medial to those neurovascular fibers as well as medial to linear semilinaris. And this will become evident as uh, I show you more videos as we go through this. Also, um, I think it's uh, important to mention the iliohypogastric and the ilioingual nerve, a branch of L1. Um, and as you go down deeper into the pelvis, uh, uh, specifically looking at myopatial orifice anatomy, uh, you'll have the genta femoral nerves. Uh, the genta branch of genta femoral nerve is more medial and travels 
uh, inside into, uh, through internal inguinal ring. The femoral branch of gentle femoral nerve uh, goes as a second uh, lateral nerve. Um, the two nerves actually split in the source muscle. The easiest way usually to find those nerves is to find the source muscle and uh, uh, then um, retract or dissect the uh, rotate the visceral sac towards yourself, exposing the source muscle and the nerves as well. A little more, more lateral after femoral branch of the femoral nerve, you're going to see more prominent branch um, of lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Um, and it's a uh, lot of family continuous uh, nerve is usually going to be uh, below the ASI, below the level ASIS. Uh, above the level ASIS, you then are going to see uh, the ilioinguinal and the iliohypogastric nerves. And about 40% of the time, the two nerves actually have a common trunk in that level. So this is a video. Uh, one of the rare times I do this procedure, uh, the posterior neurectomy, and what you'll see here. Uh, we're going to have the spinal needle to uh, show us the ASIS. Above the SIS, the nerve fibers are going to be, here is the common trunk of the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerve. Then you have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, followed by the femoral branch of the femoral nerve, and then the genital branch of the femoral nerve, entering the internal inguinal ring. And so uh, this anatomy uh, can be defined. So typically when doing... Um, Inguinal hernias, um, what I try to do is actually leave the parietal fat with transversalis fascia on top, the, uh, the lateral femoral nerve, and the uh, femoral branch of the femoral nerve. When I use electrocautery around dissecting the core structures, I try to be uh, very cautious and uh, in using electrocautery here not to injure the genital branch of the femoral nerve. Uh, the uh, the ilioinguinal and iliopagastric nerves, you should not really see unless. Uh, you, you do transverse abdominal release and rotate the kidney towards yourself. Yeah, be aware of those nerves. Uh, the way, the only way I, I can know of uh, to injure those nerves during the laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair is uh, in a thinner patients, uh, if uh, not tacking appropriately, the tack can go through the muscle and potentially entrap this ilioinguinal iliohypogastric nerve traveling through uh, between the muscle fibers. So then to go back to retromuscular anatomy. When, uh, when doing transverse abdominal release, and transverse abdominal release is really uh, a fantastic, wonderful procedure. If you think about it, it kills two birds with one stone. So, um, and how does it relate to anterior component uh, release? Uh, so when doing transverse abdominal release, what you're essentially doing, you're creating a large retromuscular space was a huge visceral sac that's going to be covering the viscera, allowing you to place this very large piece of mesh to cover a variety of defects, including the midline defects, as well as atypical hernias as the subcostal hernias, subxylical hernias, suprapubic hernias, flying hernias. All those hernias can be addressed with this type of dissection. Um, and also what it uh, allows you to do, it also allows you to apply, use essentially a cheap uh, piece of mesh. Typically what we use in our practice mostly is a medium weight macroporous mesh. Uh, those meshes are about just over $100, uh, come in large size, and uh, they do quite well in the spaces. But when talking about dissection, perhaps uh, the dissection itself is quite confusing, especially as you go through a learning curve. And one way to think about it is in transverse abdominal release, we're essentially, uh, when we're dissecting, we're connecting three spaces together. So in the midline, if say somebody has a previous non-operative virgin abdomen, if we were to make an incision in the linear alba, what we'll do, we'll see afterwards, we'll enter the preperitoneal space, the space just superficial to the phosphor ligament and the umbilical ligaments. So developing that space, that space in the middle is preperitoneal space. If we start initiating the reef stopo dissection, which includes incision and the medial aspect of the posterior rectus sheath and entering the retrorectal space, we then get into the retrorectal space. So in theory, you can actually have those three spaces connected together, the three spacing being the right retrorectal space, the preperitoneal space, and the left retrorectal space. In fact, this is exactly what we do in ETEP reef stopo dissection. So ETEP, uh, those of you not familiar, is a way to access the retrorectal space directly through a minimally invasive approach with sports in the retrorectal space. 
And a lot of times what we try to do is preserve the posterior layer by taking down the fossil ligament and umbilical ligaments together. And that's what you see here. Uh, you can see in the middle here the fossil ligament and laterally you see the left posterior to sheet on the right side of the screen and the right posterior to sheet on the left side of the screen. And essentially in this image, there are three spaces connected together, the right retroactive space together in the middle with the preperitoneal space, then together with the left retroactive space. And if for one reason or another you decide that you need to do a transversal subdominus release, then what you're doing is once you're doing this release and getting in a space behind or posterior to transverse abdominus muscle, you get a space or pre-transversalis space, or a lot of times we'll refer to it generally as a retromuscular space uh, there. So perhaps uh, the hardest thing to learn as you start out is the relationship in the upper third of the abdomen of how to complete the release. And one thing I also haven't talked about is the contributions of the diaphragm to the upper third of the posterior rectus sheet. So uh, this image right here represents, a, 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 this is an robotic procedure. We're looking at the right retroactive space. You can see the posterior rectus sheet already has been divided and uh, I have entered the right retroactive space. To the right of the screen is the subzyphoid space. You can also see the phosphor ligament hanging off from the cut edge of the posterior rectus sheet here. In the next image, what I've already done here is incise the posterior lamella ventura oblique. That is the whitish layer that covers the transversus abdominis muscle. And the reason you know that uh, the posterior rectus, uh, I'm sorry, the posterior lamella ventura oblique has been divided is because now you can see the exposed transversus abdominis muscle. To the right of the screen, uh, just medial to the cut edge of the posterior rectus sheet, you can see the preperitoneal space or subzyphoid space. That's space superficial to the phosphorm ligament. So you can see the red line here represents the line of posterior rectus sheet division. And when you do the transverse subdominus release, this is what becomes a little bit confusing for people as they're learning how to do this you actually have to curve your uh, transversal subdominus release into this subzyphoid space or preperitoneal space. That's what that blue line represents here. Essentially, what you have to imagine, you are going essentially parallel to the subcostal margin right there, which, um, and uh, yeah, otherwise um, you'll be uh, dividing into the subcostal margin if you continue going parallel to the posterior tissue. So the line of transversal subdominus release has to cross the line of posterior rectus sheet release into the subzyphoid space. At that intersection, essentially, you are connecting the three spaces together. You're connecting the preperitoneal space, which is a space superficial to the phosphor ligament, with the retrorectal space space behind the rectus abdominis muscle, with the pretransversal space, which is going to be the space super, uh, just posterior to transversal subdominus muscle. So here's the video of that. You see the scissors here uh, already developed the little bit of pitch of the solid space. And then as you divide the muscle, you export, uh, you expose this white glistening layer. The white glistening layer is the transversalis fascia. So transversalis fascia is behind transversal abdominis muscle. There's no such thing as transversalis muscle, but there's transversalis fascia. And here, as we go above the custom margin, now you'll see the fibers of the diaphragm. And it's very interesting to see this intimate relationship uh, between the fibers of the diaphragm and transverse abdominis muscle. You can see the fibers travel uh, essentially perpendicular to each other. So, and this, uh, the anatomical landmark to separate the two muscles is this uh, lower rib, the subcostal margin. Um, and uh, below the costal margin, you have the transverse abdominis muscles uh, traveling essentially um, uh, horizontally, and uh, the diaphragm fibers above the subcostal margin are traveling uh, vertically straight down uh, towards, uh, and they essentially almost make a nine degree uh, type of uh, um, uh, relationship between the two uh, traveling striations of muscle groups. And here you can see the costal margin separating the two muscles. So now I'm going to play a short video of uh, this subzyphoid dissection in the um, upper third of the left retroactive space. 
the left hand re is retracting the posterior rectus sheath. The right hand right now was dividing the posterior lamellar internal oblique, exposing the transverse abdominis muscle, and now the transverse abdominis muscle is being divided, exposing the transverse fascia. And you can see the release was curved into the subzephyr fat pad or a fat pad superficial to phosphor ligament. Now you can see the diagrams of fi uh, uh, diaphragmatic fibers because we're dissecting superficial to transversal fascia, but above the costal margin. And a, one thing I didn't talk about, again, I mentioned it briefly, is in the upper third of the abdomen, the diaphragm also contributes to the uh, posterior rectus sheath. So sometimes, depending on where you make this curb in the release and subzapho fat pad, if you make that release too high, what you will realize is you'll be dividing essentially uh, two muscles. And that becomes confusing because really the transverse abdominis release, you should only be dividing one muscle typically in the upper third of the abdomen. But once that second muscle below the transverse abdominis muscle is actually the diaphragmatic fibers. If that happens, that's okay. You have to divide the muscle in what you have to do is get behind the diaphragm. So the diaphragm fibers have to go up. No muscle fibers should be going down after making your release. So all the fibers should be up. And you should be superficial to transversal fascia and the diaphragm, the naked fiber, so the diaphragm should be exposed. Uh, so uh, what happens once you don't re recognize sometimes where, where the diaphragm fibers are? Here's the next video. Uh, what the, here I am dissecting under the right diaphragm. And in this particular case, um, I did not see where the fibers of the diaphragm were contributing to posterior rectus sheath. The transverse abdominis release uh, was complete here, and so now the dissection here starts superficial to transversalis fascia. And what I'm trying to do is develop the space um, superficial to transversalis fascia and behind the diaphragm fibers. So here I'm just bluntly dissecting here. And as I go immediately, this looks like some fatty tissue fibers, but that's actually fat hiding the diaphragm contributing to the posterior sheath. The point of dissection uh, is right there, but I thought the fat needs to come down. So you'll see I started dividing this fatty layer here, and all of a sudden I see muscle fibers. And very quickly I redirect myself because I realized the muscle fibers need to go up, and that's the diaphragm right here. But I did create a small iatrogenic morgagni defect. Uh, and uh, really, uh, in the long run, this should not make a difference because I'm actually going to bring all the muscle fibers up and my mesh is going to overlap that defect. But if I didn't realize this, essentially I could have made a quite large defect and essentially end up in uh, the right thorax uh, of the patient. So this is uh, important to understand this relationship here. Once you identify the central tendon, and if you were to dissect this, continue dissecting towards uh, along the central tendon and bringing the peritoneum down and transversalis fashion down, you will actually get posterior to the liver or above to the liver, um, and you will see a hepatic vein. Um, I've never done this in clinical practice. There has never been a need for that, uh, but this is just a demonstration in the cadaver to kind of show you the relationship of anatomy, what happens if you continue dissecting posteriorly in that space. So, and then uh, we sometimes refer to also doing transverse abdominis release as a bottoms up dissection. Again, it's the same release, except we go from bottom, from the arcuate line on the bottom towards the upper and midline. So, what happens here is you start with dividing the posterior lamella internal oblique and the transverse abdominis aponeurosis. And as you make it towards the upper third of the abdomen, then you'll start also dividing the transverse abdominal muscle fibers. But you always still have to follow the same principles. You have to um, stay medial to linear seminaries, and you have to stay medial to neurovascular bundles that innervate the rectus abdominis muscle. And the best way uh, to uh, kind of identify the arcuate whenever you're doing this robotically is essentially identify where the epigastric vessels are, then they step posterior to the epigastric vessels and develop a space of bogus. That step is gonna allow you to really identify uh, the arcuate line and then start your release. So this is a video of that. We're looking at the right side. Space of bogus has been developed. Here's the arcuate line in relation to linear sample nares. Uh, we're gonna stay medial to linear sample nares and gonna start our release. Two layers are divided here, the posterior lamella of internal oblique and transversus abdominis aponeurosis. And essentially, in this particular case, I'm trying to, trying to stay superficial to the uh, peritoneum here. As you see, the release uh, being taken uh, in the cephalad direction, up above towards the head. Uh, you'll see some neurovascular fibers in the field. 
uh, which we will preserve and the releases perform medial to those neurovascular fibers. So here is a, a release, and as we go up to the, towards the upper third, now then we start the line of transverse abdominal muscle fibers. So I have been referring so far to two layers that we divide uh, uh, when we perform a transverse abdominal uh, release. We divide the posterior lamellar internal oblique, and we either divide the transverse abdominal muscle or transverse abdominal aponeurosis, depending where we are. Uh, uh, why do I keep referring to this? Well, here's the video where uh, you can see linear sinus nares, neurovascular bundles, line division is medial to those structures. And this is about the mid-abdomen. So what I'm doing here is I'm the first dividing the posterior lamellar internal oblique. Sometimes it's very hard to tell those layers apart, and I thought I actually divide two layers, both the posterior lamellar internal oblique and transversus abdominis aponeurosis. But as I start dissecting in the space that I've created, all of a sudden, I see that the, the muscle is down, and the, the muscle that's down here is actually the transverse abdominis muscle. So what does that mean? What I've done here was only divide the posterior lamella of internal oblique, and then sneak into the space superficial to the uh, tran uh, transverse abdominis aponeurosis. As I started dissecting more laterally, then I can start seeing the muscles uh, of transverse abdominis more laterally. So this is the space between the transverse abdominis muscle and internal oblique muscle. Same space where the nerve fibers run. So actually the space has been previously described to be used, potentially useful for hernia repair. It was previously described by Alfredo Carbonell in 2008, and now referred to as Carbonell repair, where uh, the group uh, was placing mesh in between the internal oblique muscle and transverse abdominis muscles. The thing is this procedure uh, was thought to be associated with a slightly higher chance of uh, neurovascular bundle uh, injury. Again, you're developing a space where those nerves run. So the true the, uh, transverse abdominis release plane that you wanna see is to be behind the transverse abdominis muscle. So next video you'll see in order to get myself out of trouble, so I back out. And then I'm gonna make a, one more incision, one layer down through the transverse abdominis aponeurosis. And here what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cut it sharply. The, area, this, uh, the layer below is actually very thin. You can see almost paper thin layer. That's a peritoneal layer here. And I'm gonna sneak just superficial to this peritoneal layer, bringing the transverse, transverse abdominis aponeurosis up. And so here I am superficial to peritoneum behind transverse abdominis aponeurosis. And then I can divide everything medial to linear sinus nares as I continue uh, with my dissection down towards the arcuate line. So, so this is how I got myself in trouble. And this becomes important to recognize the anatomy. So when you make your release here, uh, once you start dissecting laterally, you should never see muscle down. The way I knew I was in trouble is I saw muscle down that was a transverse abdominis muscle. I backed out, and I mean, it's not an incision to get um, one level below in this case. So um, finally, um, I think, uh, you know, when doing transverse abdominis release, I think it's just uh, to summarize everything, it's important to uh, know what contributes to the uh, posterior rectus sheath. So when you make this release, uh, which you should have in the center, you should have the phosphor ligaments and umbilical ligaments in the center, uh, then followed by the posterior rectus sheath. The posterior rectus sheath in the upper quadrants has contributions. The first, the deepest layer of muscle way above at the subzacular level uh, gets contributions from the diaphragm. As you start going lower, which you will get contributions uh, then from transverse abdominis muscle as well as from the posterior lamella and internal oblique. Uh, essentially, the posterior lamella and internal oblique contributes to the superficial, that superficial layer of the posterior rectus sheath uh, as you go all the way down to the arcuate line. Uh, but the transverse abdominis muscle uh, essentially uh, travels laterally, only contributing transverse abdominis aponeurosis and distal two thirds of the posterior rectus sheath. So again, when we divide uh, a performed transverse abdominis release, we only divide the muscle layer in the upper third. Uh, sometimes you may divide uh, two uh, muscle layers in the upper third and subzacular region, which uh, depending on how low the diaphragm contributes. Down below, you should only be dividing the posterior lamella and internal oblique, which is a neurotic layer, and transversus abdominis aponeurosis. Again, aponeurotic layer, not a muscle layer. Uh, 
So hopefully uh, this uh, talk was helpful for everyone. Uh, again, the goal of this is just to uh, familiarize everyone uh, with the typical um, anatomical landmarks that we think about when doing uh, uh, put a component separation and communicate with each other. And so with that in mind, uh, thank you very much for attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any.